This is your lecture on seminal fluid. It's just a quick overview to see um, the basics that you're going to need as an um, entry level tech. Uh, this is a quick review of the anatomy and physiology of uh, uh, where spermatogenesis occurs um, and what it's controlled by. So just a quick, there's endocrine regulation hormones that are going to be um, controlling the rate of production of sperm in the male. And there are several um, organs involved. You have the hypothalamus, which is producing your gonadotropin releasing hormone or the GNRH. You have the anterior pituitary gland producing FSH and LH. And you have the testes producing testosterone and inhibit. And all of those together help to um, control uh, the rate of sperm production. In the testes themselves, you have several areas which allow the immune system to um, sort of ignore these cells as they're produced. Remember that a sperm, um, as gametogenesis occurs, as spermatogenesis occurs, your chromosomal number is going to be halved. So that obviously with an, a cell that only has half of the chromosomal um, complement is going to look very foreign to the immune system. So we have to keep these cells separate so that they don't become attacked um, and destroyed by the immune system. So there are several um, factors that help do that. Sertoli cells are probably one of the biggest. These are support cells and they help um, keep the cells uh, separate uh, from the immune system um, because they're so foreign. Um, and also you have a blood testes barrier that has very tight junctions, again, to prevent um, immune cells from sort of noticing these little um, foreigners present in the body because there's a large number of them so they would certainly be uh, antigenic. Um, once the, uh, as the sperm mature and move um, through the testes they'll move from the lumen, I'm sorry, they'll move from the main tissues um, in the um, wall of the seminiferous tubules into the lumen of the seminiferous tubules, where then they will move on to the epididymis. And at the epididymis, they, they become more mature and they uh, gain motility in the epididymis, but they're not completely mature yet. Um, they still have um, to become more mature, and that doesn't occur until they're inside the female reproductive tract. Uh, once in there, they have to penetrate the cervical membrane, they have to go through, across the entire uterus, they have to make it up into the fallopian tubes, and it's in the fallopian tubes where true uh, activation occurs, because the acrosome uh, will be activated in the fallopian tubes, and that acrosome is going to be necessary in order to um, uh, basically penetrate the oocyte that's in the female. So without that acrosome being activated, the sperm are really just uh, really fast, but not very useful. Um, so once it comes in contact with the uh, oocyte, um, the activated acrosome will release the, the enzymes, the proteolytic enzymes, that'll penetrate the, the it's, it's called, if you remember, the zona pellucida, uh, pellucida, pellucida which is, uh, surrounds the oocyte and allows the sperm to penetrate where it can fuse with the plasma membrane and then insert the genetic material into the cell. Okay, uh, so the sperm has a lot of work to do and it covers a long area, uh, but it's all of this work, its main function is to deliver that genome, get that genome from the wall of the seminiferous tubules where it starts all the way through um, into the female, through, into the oocyte. Okay, so you can see you've got the delivery, which requires the motility as well as acrosome maturation. It has to be able to penetrate not only the cervix with all the mucus and unfriendly um, atmosphere that's there, it also has to penetrate the, the immediate barrier of the zona uh, pellucida uh, surrounding the oocyte. And then um, once the, uh, the genetic material is inserted into the oocyte, it'll decondense and it'll um, also combine with the, the genetic material of the oocyte quick review there. Now when we receive a semen uh, in the lab, generally what we get it for is to assess male fertility. There are other reasons, um, for example, prostatitis. Um, there are um, uh, 
physicians who, in order to assess uh, in, uh, enlargement of the prostate, sometimes the first step is just to see, well, is there an infection? And so best way to um, assess the infection, or at least painful way, to assess an infection at the site of the prostate is to take a sperm sample and just do a culture on it. Uh, most of them will be negative, and usually in, in large prostate is some other, um, you know, maybe some benign hyperplasia or potentially prostate cancer. But we also have to rule out infection because why go through craziness if it's just, uh, you know, two weeks of antibiotics. When we look at the specimen that we get, there's a few uh, pre-analytical uh, considerations. First of all, a single specimen. Uh, outside of assessing for prostatitis, a single specimen is really not the best way to assess male fertility. Uh, so in general, some labs will require that they want two um, specimens. Okay, You also have to instruct the patient on how to collect this because this is not something you can collect. The patient collects it on his own. Um, so uh, one of the big things is uh, a certain level of abstinence from sexual activity so that because the you don't want the sperm count to be depleted when we're trying to assess fertility. So you want abstinence of, of 48 hours, but not more than seven days. So, you know, sometimes men think, well, if I'll save it up, maybe <laughs> that's crazy. So there is no saving it up. So there's that that window of two hour, two days abstinence up to seven, but not more than seven. And then we have to make sure that the container that we give to the gentleman um, it has been evaluated for sperm toxicity. Some of the um, containers are not appropriate for sperm because um, they are by themselves uh, toxic. And then finally, um, we do have to receive the specimen at room temperature and we have to receive it quickly. So uh, somebody bringing one in from home usually doesn't work very well. We really have to keep it at room temperature. The sperm die quickly. Um, if you don't um, look at it very soon. It also means that we have a responsibility that when it gets there, you got to look at it, okay? Um, so many, um, especially labs that do this uh, consistently, which are usually associated with reproductive services, they'll have a place uh, where the gentleman can collect the specimen directly at the lab site. Uh, when you get the specimen, there's a... A little bit more extensive gross exam than in other body fluids. Um, you're going to look at, obviously, you're going to look at the color and the volume and all those things. But one of the things that we don't worry about in other specimens is liquefaction, which is a process um, that uh, the semen must go through in order to allow the sperm to gain full motility. Uh, and liquefaction should normally occur at room temperature within 30 minutes, okay? So uh, you need to know, of course, when the exact collection time was, and uh, you need to let it go for 30 minutes, and then you start to examine to see if it's been uh, liquefied. If it isn't liquefied at that 30 minutes, then you check it every 10 minutes until you have a liquid specimen for up to one hour. That's when, so our exam starts literally 30 minutes after collection in order to test for that liquefaction. You really shouldn't be um, doing a count on, or a motility on a specimen that hasn't been allowed to liquefy. Uh, then we also do a viscosity test, which is actually pretty simple. Um, all you do is draw up a specimen in a wide bore uh, pipette and allow it to you know, come out drop by drop. Uh, normal semen should drop in, uh, you know, fall in drops. That's normal uh, semen. If a semen is hyperviscous or, or thicker, it'll form these long threads that are, um, and the measurement, they actually measure these things. The threads will be longer than two centimeters. So they would have like a, a place where you can read it against a ruler uh, that's on the wall kind of thing. Um, and that might be um, either a sign of infectious uh, process because of the maybe possibly increased white cells. Um, it could also be defects in some of the enzymes that are supposed to be produced by the prostate. Um, it can also be due to the absence of uh, the seminal vesicle or, or some other prostate components that would lead to um, abnormal viscosity. Okay, so really the um, 
that looking for something that's a little bit too thick um, would be it would be a problem for male fertility. We're obviously going to look for the color, the normal color of semen should be um, gray with a sort of a, a op opalescent um, uh, gray color to it. Okay. Um, when we look, the things that are abnormal that we would see, usually we see if there's blood present, you might see uh, a reddish or, or pink color, and that's called hematospermia, um, and that's because you have blood in the sperm. Uh, occasionally we'll see yellow um, color to it. That's really actually usually a sign of jaundice going on, some kind of liver um, issue. Uh, the other issue that we might see is a very dense uh, white color or a very turbid looking semen. That's usually associated with some kind of infection. It could be an infection in the urethra, not associated with testicles, or it could be an infection in any of the associated glands. Uh, uh, you know, the prostate, any of those things. So uh, it's just a general sign of inflammation. If it's if it's really like a dense white color and it's lost that that sort of opalescent color. We do a pH test on all semen that we receive and the pH should be between 7.2 and 8.0. Uh, but you can't read it until after liquefaction has occurred. So you can't read it until after that 30 minutes has expired. Um, it is acceptable to use pH strips, although you're not going to get as accurate, obviously, a result usually, um, or a pH meter, which um, a, a fertility lab would probably use a meter. Um, the, the pH, again, you can see it's um, slightly toward the alkaline side, and part of that has to do with um, the fact that it, the it's the semen is supposed to be inserted in a very acidic environment, so it's allowing a little bit um, of neutralization to occur. If you end up with a low pH on your semen, that could potentially mean that the semen is, is comprised um, almost mainly of the, pros the prostate secretions. So something's happened to the vas deferens or the seminal vesicles or something like that, maybe blockage or something like that possibly through inflammation. So there's something going on that not everything is getting into the ejaculate, okay? And then we also look at the volume. Uh, the volume um, of semen consists of the products, not just of the seminal vesicles, but also of the prostate gland. And then you also have the bulbal urethral gland, which will give a, a small amount, as well as the epididymis, will, which will give a small amount. And the normal range for volume, it's fairly wide at 1.5 to 5 mLs, okay? Now this is important. You've got to get the volume right because your count that you, you know, the, the count of your sperm cells is going to be based on the total volume, right? It has to be referred to the total volume in order to give an accurate report. Uh, report. Um, so the, the ways that we do this, now you may think, well, I'll just pipette it out, see how much I get, but um, that actually introduces too much error, and certainly a graduated cylinder would be inappropriate. The size of the, the volume range is a little bit too low. But pipetting had been used in the past, and really there was too much variation uh, from technician to technician. Um, so instead, we use pre-weighted vessels in order to determine the density. So uh, we actually uh, do a weight in order, because it's more accurate that way. And so the normal uh, uh, volume is given at about one gram per mil with a range of something between uh, 1.043 and 1.102. So you can see the range tightens up there, which helps. Some of the, um, the abnormalities, usually the abnormalities in semen analysis only go one way or the other, not both ways, but a low volume uh, would usually be caused, um, you know, there is no seminal vesicle or prostate, right? So maybe post-prostatectomy or post um, some kind of removal, they wouldn't be contributing anything, so your volume would be reduced. There could be some kind of obstruction, which does occasionally happen, which would cause a reduction of, um, of, of uh, volume. Could be from a problem with the actual 
the duct itself or something secondary to that, which we could obstruct. And then we also have retrograde ejaculation, where, which is an abnormal problem where instead of having the full ejaculate leave the, uh, the ureter, it, some of it is um, ejaculated into the urinary bladder. Um, so you have a, um, a sort of a mechanical problem in that case. In this video, we'll be looking now, at sperm specimens with varying motility scores utilizing the microscopes in our fertility our laboratory. As we zoom in on this specimen with more and more magnification, uh, we can see that the sperm motility is pretty good. Most of the sperm really accurate, are progressively uh, mortal. Sperm motility lab, scores um, represent uh, the percentage of sperm that are actively swimming in a forward direction. Low procedure, sperm motility so is a common cause of infertility. Okay. This specimen shows both um, a good count and a good motility. So the Here it is in higher magnification where we can get a better idea a of the morphology um, or shape of the sperm, sperm cells. This specimen demonstrates both a low count semen, and a low motility. And there are many immature uh, sperm forms present and the progressive motility is poor. Here is another example showing a poor count and poor motility. And, uh, this one also shows significantly abnormal uh, morphology. Here's one more example of sperm with a very low a count and a poor motility. Okay. We see that so the sperm are twitching and wiggling sperm in place, but there is no progressive sperm, motility. Total sperm in order to get a pregnancy with sperm um, like this, we will need to perform IVF with ICSI and inject the, the sperm directly and into the eggs. Function, whereas your total sperm count provides information only on the testicular function alone. Okay. Normal sperm concentration range somewhere between 15 and 150 million per mil. And normal for the total sperm count is greater than 40 um, mil per ejaculate. Okay. Now we uh, do use a hemocytometer, but it's a special um, called New the Neubauer and hemocytometer chamber slides that are preferred for counting. Uh, there are others um, made by other companies, um, so it'll really be up to the lab itself to determine which one they like the best. Obviously, the most abnormal thing that we're going to see is no sperm. Okay. Um, if you don't see any sperm in your initial count, you don't see any, then what you're supposed to do is actually centrifuge. You need a full ml, to cent don't take the whole volume to centrifuge, just one ml, and you um, centrifuge it so that you can look um, at the pellet. And you're going to centrifuge it at, at a low speed, only about uh, 3kg uh, for 15 minutes. Um, so you're not going to do a very fast, you, you're going to keep it slow so that you can still look at it. So that would be only in the case where you have no sperm observed, which is called azospermia. Okay. And then finally, um, you're also going to count, uh, you're going to do a fructose level. Um, that's measured um, in any sample that has azospermia, no sperm. Uh, and that's actually helping us to measure the, the integrity of the vas deferens in the seminal vesicles. Um, the semen uh, contains fructose, which will be the primary nutrient for the sperm. And if they don't have fructose uh, in there, uh, motility is going to be uh, severely limited. Okay. Your normal fructose level would be uh, 150 milligrams per deciliter or 13 uh, um, uh, micromoles per ejaculate. Um, depends on your lab how you want to report that. Now remember, in some cases, azospermia, while we would consider that in general abnormal finding, it might not be. There might be a case where the, the male has decided he doesn't want to produce sperm anymore. So if he's had, you know, um, uh, some procedures done to remove that, then that might be what they're looking for. They might be assessing, uh, you know, um, the possibility uh, that the procedure that they did uh, was successful. Okay, or potentially if there is some obstruction to the um, seminiferous tubules, then that would be also a sign that uh, azospermia uh, would result. Uh, and while you're doing your microscopic analysis, you'll also assess motility. Um, and you'll do that as soon as possible after uh, liquefaction because um, we want to make sure that uh, we're, keep, we're, at, we're uh, looking at the sperm at the, their peak um, 
motility, and that'll be right after liquefaction, okay? Motility can be affected by a whole bunch of things um, that, can, uh, that, that are going on with the patient. Uh, dehydration, pH changes, temperature changes, all of those are going to affect motility. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, we, want to assess, we want to educate our patient to make sure that they produce the specimen in their healthiest um, state. What you're looking for uh, are basically three different things. You're looking for sperm that have progressive motility, and, the, and you're going to count those. You're also going to look for sperm that have non-progressive motility. So they're moving, but they're not getting anywhere. Okay, so that's another uh, category. And then you're also going to look at the number of sperm that are non-modal, not moving at all. Okay, if they're progressive, um, they're in active motion, and they have some kind of linear, or they tend to go in circles, so large circular pattern. doesn't really matter how fast they're going. That's not the important thing, but they might be going uh, directly in a straight line or in a great big circle. With non-progressive um, motility, uh, they, they have, they can move. You can see the flagella beating, um, but they don't seem to be getting anywhere. They tend to go in these tiny little circles. They don't be good. They're not able to go in any directional um, uh, pattern. Okay. Um, and then, of course, there's the uh, non-modal. Uh, most of those are going to be dead, so they'll you you'll see that they're not moving at all. There's probably some kind of structural defect or something like that, um, and you'll be able to see they don't move at all. You want to um, count that percentage as well. Now, remember, motility is affected by temperature, so you need to make sure that the chamber that you use to do the counting on has been pre-warmed to 37 degrees. That would greatly affect your motility. If you're going to do a count, you don't do a count on a chili. Even room temperature is too cold, 37 degrees, okay, and you can assess that. You don't need to do it on the hemostatometer, but in some labs it's done, uh, both the count and the, the motility are done at the same time. Uh, that's up to the lab to do that, okay? And of course, the count has to be done, the motility assessment has to be done very quickly because the sample will dry at the edges, and you should never count where uh, at the edges where the drying has already started. So you got to stay in the center of where you're counting. It's possible to do a motility analysis just on a plain glass slide, um, but if you're going to combine it with your count, um, then you got to make sure everything is kept pre-warmed and that it that you don't um, look at the edges okay so what you're going to be doing is you, and this is just like the hemocytometer you're going to do it twice you're going to look at the um, 200 sperm and assess their movement into one of those three categories and you're going to do that in high power okay uh, normal sperm should have greater than a third showing progressive movement movement or greater than 40% showing progressive and non-progressive movement. Those are our two benchmarks that we're looking for, okay, uh, in order to have uh, normal motility. You're also going to take a look at morphology. Um, in the um, in reality, the, the structure of the, the, or the formation of sperm is quite, um, it's quite fragile, and it, things can go wrong at any point, okay? Now, uh, the, the correct morphology is required for ideal function, but there are some malfunctions in structure that can still fertilize. But if you have a, a large number of abnormal morphologies, it's associated with decreased fertility, okay? so. Reading the morphology is going to be highly dependent on your lab's procedures, and your lab might consider morphology um, benchmarks at a different point than another lab. So you really have to look at the procedures at your lab. And the research on this it goes a variety of ways. Sometimes they see men who have very um, large numbers of abnormal morphology, but they still the sperm still work. Um, so there is some controversy over that. You still have to report you know what an abnormal sperm is. You report the percentage. Um, and there are several different types of defects that occur. You can have defects of the sperm head, too large, 
too small, it's tapered or pyriform, it's round or amorphous, it can be vacuolated, or you could have a double head on the um, sperm. You could have defects of, of the, the, the neck or the midpiece of the sperm. The neck could be bent. You might have cytoplasmic droplets um, at the midpiece, um, cytoplasmic droplets left over from the parent cell, not supposed to be there anymore. And then, of course, you can have tail defects. The tail could be too short, it could be double, broken, or bent, something like that. Um, so you're going to count up the number of abnormalities that you see, you know, morph morphological abnormalities, and um, count them for the assessment. And this can be done, basically, you can create um, a push smear um, and do a stain. The stain really can be any kind of stain that you like. Gimza, hematoxylin, whatever kind you like. Um, a lot of places just do the Gimza because you're just really looking for the overall morphology. You're not looking for intracellular structures. And then we also do viability. Um, we have to figure out if the non-modal sperm that are there, the ones that aren't moving, are they dead or are they alive? Um, if they are still alive but non-modal, they can be still used by certain reproductive labs at maybe in an intracytoplasmic sperm injection procedure which is one of the fertility procedures that they have and so what they do in order to do a viability test is we do either uh, dye exclusion assays or hypoosmotic swelling tests uh, the dye exclusion assay um, relies on the fact that damaged uh, cell membranes plasma membranes will allow the entry of stains into the cell that shouldn't normally be entered. And the, the classic case of this is the E, S, and Y stain. So you add the E, S, and Y to your uh, sp specimen, and if the cell is dead, the cell is going to fill up with the stain. If it's still alive, it'll be excluded, OK? The hypoosmotic swelling test is based on the premise that only live sperm with intact and um, well-developed membranes will swell in a hypotonic solution um, and you can see that in the tail section under phase contrast so that phase contrast microscopy so that one is a little bit more technical as far as the microscopy goes whereas the dye exclusion pretty simple if they fill up with the stain they're dead and then we also have to give um, an analysis of the other cells that we see Semen often contain um, uh, maybe white cells or even uh, spermatocytes on non-mature cells um, that are round and appear similar uh, um, under phase contrast. So in order to differentiate between them, you're going to use the peroxidase stain to differentiate the um, polymorphonuclear cells, which would be positive from the spermatocytes. And what you're looking for is if you have a lot of white cells in there, that's pretty um, conclusive that you have some kind of inflammation, potentially an infection going on. So what we do on the uh, hemocytometer is we count 200 mature sperm cells and determine the number of round cells or you know, non-flagellated cells that are in that count and divide that by two. Um, and each round cell counted um, on the on the high dry field corresponds to approximately one million per milliliter. That's what they've. I don't know who determined that, but somebody determined that. The upper limit of normal for white cells is one per million. Um, the upper limit for immature sperm cells is five per million. Okay, so that's where you need your um, peroxidase stain to differentiate between the two. The morphologies that we have, um, uh, this is just one example of some uh, normal morph uh, abnormal morphologies that you might see. Uh, you can see the head defects that are there, uh, the uh, neck and midpiece uh, defects, and then the tail defects. Um, and so I'm not going to read them all. You can see what they are. Obviously, um, with the head defects, probably the biggest place for abnormalities is in the acrosome. Uh, when you have some kind of acrosomal deficiency, um, or, or even if it's a nuclear abnormality, um, 
uh, those are the most common along with a lengthened mid piece the mid mid piece, uh, neck piece is, is too long those are the most common abnormalities that we find in sperm when you see the tapering uh, of the head uh, that usually refers to a nuclear um, morphology issue okay um, which you can see there in the elongated one where the head becomes tapered um, even the um, amorphous one the head that's totally wrong shape okay um, a normal sperm head is somewhere between four and five micrometers in length and 2.5 to 3.5 micrometers in width and has um, uh, an acrosomal area which should be about 40 to 70 percent of the head okay so um, when you have the um, number those are things that if you have a um, uh, optical uh, micrometer an optical eyepiece with a micrometer on it you'll be able to make those measurements and determine large small it's hard to tell if they're all large or if they're all small um, if they're really abnormal it's only when percentages of them look unusual that it's easier to tell um, so you do need to measure for those ones uh, when we have a, a, a high number of um, abnormal forms um, the, the likelihood of infertility is increased now this is going to be the percentage of abnormal to normal that part is controversial one laboratory is you know one reproductive center is going to interpret it a little bit differently than another um, ASCP defines um, the likelihood of infertility increasing when the normal forms is below 4% so what they're saying is when you have 96% abnormal forms you're likely to have infertility well that sounds pretty obvious to pretty much anybody so there are a lot of other labs that, uh, and other places where you have um, a different opinion as to the percentage that makes it likely for infertility and then the only vocabulary word that I want to add here because I said it on the last page is a pyriform head a pyriform head is the teardrop shaped head uh, that you occasionally see it's not shown on this chart but I said it on the other page so I want to show you and and these so this is a nice cartoon here's some other the pyriform head here you can see C D and E where it's a kind of tear dropped or kind of looks like a candy corn to me so it's a little off those are pyriform in a and B you can see there's like a dent or some kind of um, like almost like a bubble looking that's been pressed into the acrosome on a and B and those are called knobbed uh, acrosomes uh, in F uh, we have nuclear vacuoles you can see the arrow pointing to those um, in uh, G there's actually it's called a diadem defect that's a defect with the actual um, the nuclear portion of the head itself and of course there's something wrong with H it's detached from its flagella okay so that's no good it won't get anywhere in uh, I uh, where you have the the twisting of the flagella uh, that's actually a, um, a reflex uh, problem with the motion of the flagella it's called the distal reflex and so you would count those as well and then in uh, J and K where you have it's kind of like really almost tied up around the midpiece um, that's called uh, a dag like defect where the mid piece is it's actually either completely bent like in K or almost broken off like in J you can see that uh, the pinch is quite tight on J uh, L has something called a proximal droplet which is, it's a cytoplasmic droplet that's been left um, at the top of the mid piece you can see it right at the base of the head so it's only proximal because it's proximal to the head okay but it's still a cytoplasmic droplet in M you can see there's still a droplet there too but that would be distal because it's farther away from the head so the location is determined but it's still a cytoplasmic droplet um, in um, N and O we have something called um, tetroid okay where you have a um, um, uh, severe or um, severe in N and uh, moderate in O apparently these are issues with the, again the head the nuclear count 
and then P, we put P in there because they're perfectly normal. Okay, that's what they're supposed to look like, okay? So that you have some reference. In the process of sperm development, I put this in here so that you would know what the cells look like because, of course, you want to know what um, a spermatocyte looks like if it shows up in the semen, okay? It, it doesn't... A, a, a small number might end up in there, but you don't want a lot in there. So recognizing what they are, and you can see what the problem is, the spermatocyte looks an awful lot like a white cell. So you have to be able to differentiate between the two. And then finally, some of the other things you might see on a stain smear. Um, the cells, just like everybody else, um, you can see the spermatocytes. Um, and the white cells in the different um, boxes, okay? Um, uh, just be aware of what they look like. Okay, so ones that obviously the neutrophils are easy because they're segmented. But the germ cells, they can still be about the same size as a white cell and their, um, their nucleus looks quite round, similar to, you might mistake it as a monocyte or something like that. 